essentially what the issue here is that after exploratory data analysis has allowed you to identify structure in your data, the question still arises whether a statistical model that you might then apply to, for example, predict unknown data, the properties of unknown data, um, or ask whether any distinction you make or any conclusion you make is statistically valid and, and significant, um, whether these hypotheses are rational, i.e. whether we have support that the hypothesis can, is, is actually supported by the data. So what does it mean that the data supports a hypothesis? Um, probably what we all think about when we hear hypothesis testing is p-values. So that's something we will really need to qu uh, clarify a little, especially since in in recent um, <clears throat> in recent work, the the use of p-values has really come under fire, or the abuse of, of p-values. Um, we'll talk a little about a little bit about that. Okay. So once we have a statistical model that describes the distribution of our data, we can explore data points with reference to our model, and we typically ask questions such as, is a particular sample a part of the distribution, or is it an outlier? Or a very frequent question, can two sets of samples have been drawn from the same distribution, or did they come from different distributions? So this is the, the classical um, control and experimental cohort type of experiment. This is confirmatory data analysis. So there's, a li there's some concepts um, we need to clarify. Um, we often talk about the null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. So somewhat informally stated, the null hypothesis states that nothing of consequence or nothing of interest is apparent in the data distribution. This means the data completely corresponds to our expectation. We learn nothing new, we learn nothing surprising um, from looking at the data. <coughs> the alternative hypothesis states that some effect is apparent in the data distribution and the data is different from our expectation and we need to account for something new. Now note that this is not, you know, a, a stringent hypothesis in the sense that we're explaining what that hypothesis is. We don't have an alternative account of our data. The alternative hypothesis simply is the rejection of the null hypothesis. And additional work might be required to exactly model and describe what our data is like instead. And in order to distinguish between uh, null and, and alternative hypotheses, um, we use statistical tests. And the possible numbers of uh, statistical tests is large. No, it's not large. It's huge. It is absolutely impenetrably, impossibly huge and subtle for the non-initiated. So if you don't have a solid background in statistics, don't spend too much time on statistical tests. You will make mistakes that way. If you think that there's something statistically involved, do get statistical help. And specifically, um, do not go come out of this workshop and just because I mentioned p-values and null hypotheses, um, come to, to unwarranted conclusions in, in your actual data. So what we can do here is discuss a little bit and I'll show you along some of the, some of the simple tests that you can do and discuss what, what they mean. But um, there, this is really a domain of expertise that should not be un underestimated. Okay, 
So common types of tests that we often come across are things like one sample tests where we compare a sample with a population or two sample tests where we compare samples with each other or even paired sample tests where we compare uh, matched pairs of observations and we ask whether their difference is in some way significant. Um, <clears throat> now, all these tests are basically done with a statistic in mind. In that sense, a statistic is a kind of measure, a kind of, of uh, outcome for an algorithm that we apply to our data set. So such a measure, um, for example, could be um, a z-test, i.e. a test that compares a sample mean with a normal distribution and asks um, how, how many uh, standard deviations um, does my sample mean deviate from what I would expect in a normal distribution. So if the sample and the, the control is normally distributed, I can then translate that into a probability. Um, that only really works well if uh, the samples are not skewed and are symmetric and it actually is a normal distribution. A uh, t-test compares a sample mean with a t-distribution, which relaxes some of the requirements on normality, i.e. That, that we should have an underlying Gaussian distribution. Um, How do you distinguish normal distribution and t-distribution? Like, Well, for example, through a QQ plot. Okay. Yeah. So, so when we plot it, what should we see there to be able to say it's a normal distribution? Well, if you do a QQ plot against the normal distribution, a Q norm plot, okay. um, then you will find that all the rank points kind of lie on the same line. And if you, um, you, you weren't here on the first day, right? Uh, we went through that example specifically on, on comparing normal distribution and t-distribution. So maybe just download that if, you, if you're looking for an example. Very briefly, um, you will see deviations. T-distributions have a much larger tail than normal distributions, so uh, outliers are much more common and you will, you will see them more frequently. And that, that has a very, very clearly um, visible signature on the comparison. Um, so this, this relaxes it. Something that's very important to remember are that often um, we, we have no reasonable model of what our distributions should be. It might be a very highly skewed distribution that doesn't correspond to one of the standard um, probability distributions. It might be something that's bimodal or, or whatever. And in this case, often we use non-parametric tests, i.e. Uh, tests that translate uh, differences only into rank orders, and these also can sensitively um, pick up um, experiments. So what hypothesis testing really means, regardless of what tests you apply, you have some observation, you have a model of your data, and you ask about the probability that the model of your data could contain your observation. So what's the probability that my model would contain the observation? So um, there are um, errors you can make in that. And these are often summarized like this. Um, if the null hypothesis is true, we can accept the null hypothesis, and then we are correct. If the null hypothesis is false, or the alternative hypothesis is true, we can reject the null <coughs> hypothesis, and then we're also correct. But there's two ways to make errors. We can make a so-called type 2 error, and I always discourage the use of the word type 2, because you can also call it a false negative. And a false negative immediately tells me what you're talking about, if you tell me something about a type 2 error, I need to try to remember the stats knowledge I should have paid better attention to somewhere as an undergraduate, and will probably get it wrong anyway. So I like to use false negative, I like to be explicit, and I, I advocate 
other people to please do the same. Um, reject, um, uh, get type ones and type two errors away to the dustbins of statistical history where they really belong to. So what's a false negative? Well, a false negative says you think it's a negative, but in fact it's not. So you accept the null hypothesis, but in fact the alternative hypothesis was true. You think there was nothing going on, but you simply missed the effect. Um, this is when you miss important correlations in your data or you, you miss the genes that you're really interested in, perhaps because there's too much variation in your data. Alternatively, um, you can have a false positive. A false positive m means you identify something that you're really, really interested in, but in fact, um, the signal that you got that caused you to identify it was just stochastic fluctuations or noise. This is where you waste your granting agency's money because you're going to be following up something that will never turn out to be productive in any sense. So both errors should be avoided. And the question is, when can we decide that, when can we safely decide that something is we, something we should be believing in and, and pursue, or when is it quite likely that, in fact, we should be accepting the null hypothesis? Um, this is a little bit out of order. Um, so in, in my scripted example, I'll, I'll be using um, t-tests um, for comparing uh, differential expression values. t-tests apply to observations in principle that are independent and normally <coughs> distrib distributed with equal variance. And then the one sample t-statistic, or t versus a population is defined as the value that you get if you compare the mean value with the um, <clears throat> with the mean of the population, so the mean value of your samples, um, sample mean, and the mean of the population divided by the standard error, i.e., the squared uh, um, uh, square root difference, some root sum squared difference of all the values to the mean. So basically, the larger the error, the smaller your t value is going to become. And in this way, we penalize um, noisy samples and take into account that uh, in order for samples to give us a lot of confidence, um, they should not be noisy and they should basically have all, um, uh, all close to the same value. So, in a two-sample t-test, we test if the means of two distributions are the same. Again, we are looking at data sets that are independent and normally distributed with a mean of something and a variance, and we assume, and that's important, and that's maybe the most tenuous assumption across the board in biology, we assume that the two groups are independent. And this is really tenuous in biological samples because there can be dependencies through confounding factors or through, um, <coughs> through subtle interactions that you don't yet know about. And that really can, can cause uh, a lot of grief in the statistical analysis. And we also assume that the variance is the same, but um, both the normality and the variance are not that critical if you have enough data and, and, and enough measurements. So given that, two-sample t-test um, basically um, works out in a similar way, but with a difference in uh, that now describes the difference between means. Now, once the t's are computed, you can translate them into p-values. Um, there's, there are, there's a mapping possible between the t-test and the p-value, just like we can get p-values from, from normal distribution. And then you can start um, talking about your p-values and um, asking whether a particular observation is significant. Now, I'd like to point you to a couple of papers that have recently appeared. If you could load... Um, 
the hypothesis testing part of the tutorial. There are three PDF files in within the files that should uh, download. If you if you open the significance revisited, you will get a paper from Nature Neuroscience, Erroneous Analysis of Interactions in Neuroscience, a Problem of uh, Significance. This was published in 2011. And what the authors did is they, they analyzed papers in, in neuroscience about their interpretation of p-values. And specifically, in a distressingly large number of papers, they um, <clears throat> found statements that are similar to something like this. The percentage of neurons showing Q-related activity is increased with training in the mutant mice, P less than 0, 0.05, so a significant result, but not in the control mice with a P of greater than 0, 0, 0.05. So the problem of that is that what's being done here is two different independent one-sample t-tests. So one group here is significantly different from the population, and one group here, the control mice, is not significantly different from the population. So up to that point, this is correct. However, the inference is that mutants and controls are somehow different. Probably when you read this, this completely slipped by you. But the inference of this sentence is that mutants and controls are different. But this is not supported by the statistics. Imagine that you have 10,000 mice, and the mutant mice give you a p-value of 0.051, and the controls give you a p-value of 0.049. That would not be significant, but the other one would be significant. Now you would be arguing for a difference with, uh, between the mutant and the control mice, which is based only in a difference of p-values of 2 in 1,000. That is almost certainly not a correct difference. So this is where a two-sample t-test would have needed to be done. You compare directly the effect in the mutant mice with the control mice. And there's no telling how that will come out. Apparently, there was possibly a lot of variation in the control mice. And then the difference may no longer be statistically significant. So this is, this is a really important cautionary tale. I mean, if I tell you this like that, you'll say, ah, but that's obvious. And I understand that you know, as, soon, as soon as I say it. But uh, these are papers that were published in Science, Nature, Nature, Neuroscience, Neuron, and the Journal of Neuroscience. So these are not lightweight papers and lightweight authors and not lightweight reviewers either. So this is a really important cautionary tale about um, statistical analysis and the many traps and pitfalls that are in that. So if I say um, R makes it really easy to do statistical analysis, but there's no guarantee that you are doing the statistical analysis correct and don't assume that just because I showed you how to run a t-test that you'll be doing the right t-test in the right context under, on the right numbers and the right data. Um, that's not going to fly. And this is where I come from when I say that. Even people who, who are the absolute experts in their fields are prone to make very fundamental errors that probably in some cases um, will lead to irreproducible results, or in the worst case, to high-profile retractions. So, so be cautious. This is well um, analyzed here. Moreover, um, <clears throat> and that's something um, that's in the other two papers, in a Nature News and Views article, of this year, there's a report of the American Statistical Association, um, this is in March and this year, warning that the p-value is often misused. And 
the the American Statistical Association has um, issued some guiding principles how to properly use p-values in the interpretation of your data. Um, so p-values alone are probably not sufficient to interpret your data because really all they tell you is whether the null hypothesis might hold or might not hold under certain conditions. They don't tell you anything about your experiment. They tell you something about the absence of the effect. So if you, if you think your hypothesis is true because the p-value says so, this is wrong. It simply says the null hypothesis that your hypothesis was false has a low chance of being correct. Um, the paper itself is here, this ASA statement. Wasserstein et al. Uh, 2016, and it has a very nice initial uh, discussion of why this statement was necessary in the first place. I think the reasoning is, is very familiar to you, since you all have been in the field for a while. Why do so many colleges and grad schools teach a p-value cutoff of 0 0.05? And that's because what the scientific community and the journal editors use, right? And why do so many people still use a p-value cutoff of 0 0.05? Well, because that's what you're being taught in college and grad school. So there's a certain kind of a circularity in the sociology of science um, that doesn't just apply to p-values. Um, applies to other things like cluster LW. Um, we teach it because it's what we do, and we do it because that's what we teach. So this is a nice discussion, but it also, of course, contains the actual um, recommendations, the ASA statement on statistical significance and p-values, which is, which is quite readable, makes for great background reading. So p-values of 0 0.05. What's a p-value anyway? Um, it's a measure of how much evidence we have against the alternative hypothesis or the probability of making an error or something that biologists want to be below 0 0.05 or maybe in the best way the probability of observing a value as extreme or more extreme by chance alone. Now that's something that, that you really ought to understand um, we're talking about a distribution of possible values here, and we're talking about a single observation of a statistic. And we're not asking what is the probability of that observation, because the probability of a single number within a continuous distribution approaches zero. It's just one point on the number line. We're asking about that number or something even more extreme. So basically we're asking if you think of this as a Gaussian or, or a normal distribution, um, this side here, so here we have our normal distribution, um, <clears throat> and now we have an observation, say it's out here. What we're asking about is the area of the curve from here to infinity as compared to the area of the curve from here to infinity. That's in the, in the one sample, in the, in the, in the uh, asymmetric case, or uh, you can also uh, use that in the symmetric case with absolute values. Um, now, this little sketch actually also immediately illustrates to you an alternative to using rigorous statistical tests for um, computing or calculating p-values. Because if you are able to simulate your statistical distribution here, you don't need to integrate it. So we can have a simulation where that, that follows this distribution and then ask, how many of my simulation results 
are smaller than, and how many of my simulation results are larger than my observation. And then simply from the simulation counting statistics, um, you, can, you can say, well, how probable is it that a value as deviant as the one that we've actually observed occurs under these circumstances? And that's something that's, that's actually powerful. Because if you are able to capture the ideas that you embody in your experimental design in a simulation, you can use this very, very simple simulation procedures to get rigorous estimations of p-values of individual observations. You don't need to think very clearly about whether something is normally distributed. You don't need to know what the proper conditions are when you should be applying a t-test or an f-test or chi-square test statistics or an ANOVA or whatever. You simply do your simulation. So rather than having the statistical and mathematical expertise to know whether your analytical test is correct and hoping to find that that particular test models your biology well, your expertise is in the biology and needs to go into the simulation and make sure that the simulation is in fact relevant and not prone to some kind of a sampling error or bias. But since the simulation is in your domain of expertise, you have a much better a much better confidence in that what you're doing is basically correct. So this is another way where programming with R or you know programming with computers can be extremely helpful using simulation tests to estimate probabilities. Um, for example, permutation tests are one case. Um, for example, if you have data that, that has multiple categories associated with each observation, you select the statistic, a mean difference, or a t-statistic, it doesn't matter, any statistic, well, most, many statistics will do, and compute the statistic for the observation of interest, which then gives you one value. And then you do a large number of permutations of, say, um, if you're looking at uh, expression profiles, you, you just shuffle the expression profiles all over, and with these permuted observations, um, you then calculate how many of the observations are smaller and how many of the observations are larger, divide that by the number of trials, and this gives you an estimate of, of the probability. And you can even do that many times over and see what the variation in these estimates is and then give you some kind of a confidence interval on your predicted p-value that you have. So in, in principle, this is um, this is a bit of a game changer that you're able to do that. Uh, in this sense, you're able to to um, to defer the to to shift the required expertise into the biological domain and not into the mathematical statistical domain. Now this is, this is my error. Um, this script expects the data objects to persist, which of course they don't if we reload them in a separate project. Um, what do we do at this point? Okay, I will need to fix this and re-upload this so that that you have the actual functions available. Um, but I don't think that we will usefully be doing that um, today. Um, I, I think this is something that you can readily do at home. I, uh, the script is extensively commented. Um, of course, like with all the scripts, if there's something that you're interested in and that isn't clear, um, you, uh, you're welcome to email me and I will, I will try to clarify it by updating the script. Um, what I'd like to do alternatively is at least take you through non-parametric analysis, the Wilcoxon test because this is something that really comes up a lot, something that's appropriate, especially if you have 
relatively small data samples that are um, that don't correspond to good statistical models, for example, because they're not normally distributed. So, <clears throat> and I also like that because you, we can do some little bit of final playing with uh, programming R. So let's generate two random data samples with slightly different means. So the, the means are going to be very slightly different. Um, in this case, uh, we define 25 samples in, my, in the first data set and 25 samples in the second data set. And um, throw all that together. And one of the set of samples we're going to draw from a normal distribution um, with a mean of 10. And one of the data sets we're going to draw from a normal distribution with a mean of 11. So not very different. And if we box plot them, here's where we see the, the distribution differences. So um, we can, if we plot this, we can s kind of you know, see the trend of difference in these values. The red ones were the, the ones taken from the distribution with um, a mean of uh, 11, and the green, uh, the the black ones were from the distribution with a mean of 10. And, you know, there's, there's a trend there, but it's kind of hard to say. And especially, for example, if we plot them in a random order, it's kind of hard to say whether, you know, there is actually a difference between these two population groups. So if we simply compare the mean and uh, the standard deviations, um, I, I don't know what, what the result would be then. Now, Wilcoxon test um, works in the way that we count for each observation of one group how many observations from the other group are ranked below it. So whenever we have, a, say, a black observation, we ask how many red observations are smaller than that black point. And for two equal distributions, regardless of what the distributions are, we would expect that for every observed point, there's an approximately equal number of observations from one distribution and from observ of observations from the other distribution below it. So let's illustrate this. Um, if I order my um, p-values by, uh, sorry, if I order my observations by size, um, I get the following picture of, of red and black points here. And I think it becomes a little more visible that there is a trend of the red points to be towards the top and a trend to be for more black points to be uh, towards the bottom here. So now if we do a Wilcoxon test on that, we get a p-value. And that p-value is 0 0.03. So does this mean we have two significantly different populations? Well, we've, we've just talked about the normal p-value cutoff of 0 0.05. So is 0 0.035 smaller or larger than 0 0.05? Smaller. So we conclude that this is statistically significant. Yay! One thing we could do, however, is ask, well, how robust is this rate? And that's what I'd like you to ask. First of all, um, I've set the seed to a particular value. So I would like each and every one of you to repeat this with 
a random number of choice. So a randomly but different reproducible value. Um, if you all choose 42 or if you all choose 7 as your random number, that's not very random. So I, I think to make it truly random, use an expression like this, which you can rerun. If we choose from a thousand random numbers, um, then we will probably not have the same random number twice in the room. So the range of numbers is large. Um, if you imagine that somebody asks you for a random number, any random number, and expects you to produce something which is not going to exceed the boundaries of the universe, um, that's a really poor expectation. The small random numbers that we usually produce as humans are certainly not random, given the space of possible numbers that exist, which are infinite in, in size and length. Anyway, so pick a number, replace the 53, run the same analysis, look at your box plot, see if you believe that these are different, Look at the order, and then calculate the Wilcoxon test for your version of randomly chosen numbers of 25 observations for which the means differ by approximately 10% of value. And I'd be curious how often we find something that's significant. Okay, so I think you, most of you have, or almost all of you have run this. Now let's see a show of hands. Who got a significant different result? Okay, so this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, who got a result that was different but not significant? One, two, three, four. So the majority of people in the room actually gets a result that is significant by three times more frequently than, than not. So basically what this seems to be telling us is that the Wilcoxon test is able to pick out differences even in the small population of differences where the mean is less or is approximately 10% a different of value. So it's pretty pretty sensitive. Um, we, we, we say that um, that non-parametric tests lose so-called power, i.e. we need to do more of the tests uh, versus parametric tests. So if you can do a, a rigorous, say, t-test which works on numerical values rather than just rank values, um, this is going to be even more sensitive. So I think this illustrates that we're kind of um, able to pick out really, um, um, really big differences. Now, as a second test, I would like you to repeat this test for a single random population with 50 elements and a mean of 10.5. Instead of a mean of 10 and 11, we now use a single population with a mean of 10.5 and at first we plot the black and red circles as before. So here you change the parameters of your normal distribution. We do the same thing in this loop here, but instead of 10 we'll take 10.5 and instead of 11 we'll take 10.5. So now these are in fact um, different populations. So in this case, this is our negative control for the Wilcoxon test. The negative control says, well, um, in, in the positive control we've repeated this several times o over with different numbers and we've been able to determine that we get a different result 
more often than not, or a significant result more often than not, if the populations are different. Now the question is the other way around. Well, if the populations are actually not different, how often do we, do we get a result that appears different? So that's our negative control here. So do the same thing for a single random population, no matter what the, what the seed value is that you use. Use a mean of 10.5, so they are the same population here, plotted again with black and red circles, and see if it looks different. So I'll do this myself. this the same. This shall be 10.5. This shall be 10.5. <clears throat> Let's see what we have here. The box plots turn out to be quite similar, slightly different. There's more variation in my first set here. No obvious trend in the values. Um, if we plot this, well, really can't tell what's going to turn out here. And the Wilcoxon test tells me p-value of 0.7, which is significantly more than um, 0.05. So in this case, my negative control gave me um, a negative result, i.e. a p-value that is not significant. So who got a p-value greater than 0 0.05 if the two means are the same, i.e. 10.5? So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 people in the room. Who got, got a statistically significant result? One. Two. What was it? I was 0 0.037. 0 0.037. So that's about as much as we had the last time with the difference in means. And how much did you have? Uh, 0.028. Okay, again, about half of the required p-value. So even with the small number of experiments in the room, we can see that we can be wrong relatively frequently. So how often would we expect to be wrong. What's the distribution of um, a Wilcoxon test under these circumstances? So one way to find that out is to simply illustrate this. Now, to do the same thing that you've done before, but do this in a loop, let's say, um, yeah, let's do it a thousand times. So let's build a vector of p-values as an empty vector initially, numeric and n, where we define n to be 1,000 number of trials. Okay, so if I initialize p-value like this, I have a numeric vector of 1,000 elements, and they're all zero initially. And now I write a loop that will do the same procedure that I've done before with random starting conditions, or rather not setting any seed so that the randomness just continues going on and trying um, the Wilcoxon test and figuring out what the p-values are. Um, 
actually I need to solve a little problem before that. I need to know how do I actually capture this number 0 0.7292. Right now I'm just printing it to screen. Do I have to write it or type it into an Excel spreadsheet and then then take it from there or a thousand times that that would be onerous. Yes? Yeah, I think you just use the dollar sign it opens a list, right? On, is it a list? Is it what? What is it? How do we know? What would you intuitively know? I think somebody mentioned on, on our first day, the thing to know about R is that it's not intuitive. Well, we've been beating our heads around, uh, around this uh, for three days now. So intuitively, what would you do with this Wilcoxon test to try to capture some of its output? Right, a variable. Assign the output. Let, to assign the output, that's what I would try. So let's try this here. Um, so this P is a list of seven different items. And the different items are statistic and attributes, parameters, p-value, null value, alternative, method, data name, and so on. And this is what we're looking for. So the p-value is a title of our list. OK, now I need to go through trial and error. Either I do this, and now my p is this p value. Okay, that's good. Now I wonder, could I also have done that? Probably. Same thing. Okay, so both ways of syntax are the same thing. Or I could have assigned this and then used my list extraction or the dollar operator on the assigned value. But that's the way we capture our p, p value. Okay, so we need a for loop for i in 1, 2, n. And we need to do something, and as a result of that something, we need to assign something in the ith position of our vector p value, which captures the outputs. I'm not going to type this something. That's up to you now. Well, without hopefully giving too much away, um, our calculations of the p-value go into this spot. So we calculate the p-value, <clears throat> and then we put it into our slot here. But, of course, if we run our loop like that, obviously we'll get 1,000 times the same value. What we still need to do is to calculate different random values. So... For simplicity and because it's too late to do any significant thinking, I'll just simply copy this. Um, we could code this more efficiently and more easily, but now is not the time. So I have a loop here that at 1,000 time empties a matrix and, and initializes a new matrix object. And I have to make sure my n 
is correctly defined, lowercase n, And so I run that a thousand times. I build a matrix with column one, column two of 25 elements each. <clears throat> um, I take both of them from the same normal distribution of 10.5. And I think that's it. Right? Any mistakes? Well, it gives me something. So, how do I look at these numbers? What should I be doing? I can take the mean. Interesting, what do we expect? I, I wouldn't know. What's what's the mean result of a Wilcoxon test on the same population under these circumstances? It is close to zero. Actually, that's odd. Exactly. We're going to look at a histogram. I mean, this would be a, a hugely significant p-value each and every single time. So let's look at a histogram. Histogram of p-value. Can you say the x between 0 and 1? So most of our values were really, really small. And if I set the x limb between 0 and 1, I'm only going to see nothing. So that's unexpected. Um, have a convergent problem, and it's returning. Maybe it's returning a string, and it's not converting to a numerical value. Um, I I think you have something there because I see large numbers of zeros there. Um, actually, I see almost only zeros. So why? Is <laughs> oh no, the twenty-third value is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, none of this is expected. Okay, so what are we doing wrong here? I'm using oh, I. I, I is the same. Yeah, and of course then the two I's interfere yeah. with each other. Yeah. Okay, so let's not even do this. Let's, let's actually uh, simplify this. Yeah. Uh, instead of <clears throat> filling the matrix, I can just fill an object here with 25 values each. Call this M1, M2, or the other way around. So these are my two variables here. I don't need that loop because I, I do this directly. I don't need to initialize the matrix. And I just do a Wilcoxon test on M1 and on M2. And I have to remove that. Obviously, Michelle has seen me mistype many more things previously <laughs> over the years. I think this looks a bit more present. Re bit more representable even though it's late in the day. And now I actually get numbers that I expect and a histogram of p-values that are uniformly pretty much distributed between 0 and 1. So this means 5% of my tests under these conditions are going to turn out to be significant and 1% of my tests under this conditions under these conditions are going to be 
highly significant with a p-value of 0.01. So what you've seen here is multiple testing in action. Even though there is no difference between our populations, if we run them often enough, we will find examples that are statistically significant. So be doubly and triply cautious to use the right number of multiple testing um, corrections. Now, I'm tired. You're tired. <laughs> I think it's time to close up. I don't actually have any, any closing remarks. You had a question? Yeah. Uh, how do you test if it's a robust test How do you test if it's what? Robust. If it's a robust test or not? Exactly. Yeah. So what we've done here with, with this um, Wilcoxon test is we've looked at the distribution of values that we get if the null hypothesis is true. And that tells us how, how, how large the outcome is. Now, there's a, there's a very general procedure that, that we can use for uh, asking whether a test is robust in the sense in the in the sense of robust not sensitive on details of the data and that's so-called bootstrapping procedures so in a bootstrapping procedure say you have a hundred elements and and you wonder whether your your t test depends on the presence or absence of only you know a very small number of them so what you'll do is you'll remove 10 of the elements and replace these 10 empty slots with values that you randomly pick from the remainder. And then you rerun your test. And you do that many, many times over. And if your distribution of p-values is very tight and you always get the same value, then you know that your test is not critically dependent on the details of your data. But if it's like all over the place here, then your bootstrapping test tells you that there's some something critical in individual elements and unless you're absolutely sure that these elements are what they ought to be and are not just outliers or artifacts um, then your results have to be seen with great caution so this this kind of this there's, there's several ways to define robustness incidentally this is a kind of robustness that's that has to do with sensitivity to the details of data or to initial conditions um, have a safe trip home thanks for coming by and um, I hope that you enjoyed these three days as much as I did.